Um, yeah, awesome. Been a really enjoyable uh, day so far. It's been great to check out uh, some of the other talks and there's been so much, so much great information shared already. Uh, so um, rather than also perhaps overlap too much with some of the uh, wonderful talks we've had and diving deep into the soil microbes and the rhizosphere, I'm going to take a, a slight departure, still very much overlapping. We'll still very much talk about these, um, these topics and uh, take just maybe a step back and look at it from a slightly bigger um, systems approach. Think about how maybe we can use biologicals within the context of the wider farming system and with a particular focus as the title suggests. So we're gonna really dive in a little bit to the importance of roots uh, and uh, how important they are, not only for uh, a whole range of different soil related benefits um, and outcomes, but um, particularly for microbes as well um, and overall the system productivity and, and resilience. So let's dive straight into it. Um, we're going to touch on just some of start off with a little bit on some of the fundamentals of photosynthesis and a little touch a bit there on plant nutrition and how we can optimize nutrition to drive photosynthesis. And that's really important because that's what also helps to drive root biomass, uh, growing roots. And the more roots ultimately we can grow, the more food we are providing for the soil biology. So that's really going to be the slant that we'll take and then expand on that and touch briefly on then the role of root exudates. And then we're going to move into some of the um, emerging evidence about soil organic matter, building soil organic matter, and how important uh, the microbes are. Um, we're going through a bit of a paradigm shift, um, being focused very heavily on the importance of plant material and the decay of plant material to build soil organic matter. And of course, that is still very important, but we've also seen the other half of which is the important contribution in which the microbes themselves make in that process, in that transformation of plant litters uh, to build soil organic matter. So I'm gonna just share some of the new evidence on this. And that'll um, lead us into then a few closing slides on integrated nutrient management. Again, this is this part where I just wanna kind of pitch the importance of practices and products and management in which we use um, and, and sit that within the context of the, of the wider whole, uh, within the wider farming system. Okay, so it starts here, it starts with photosynthesis, that, that beautiful process that happens all over the planet, arguably thanks to this, we can, um, we, we're here today uh, thanks to this process. Um, of course, plants are breathing in carbon dioxide, uh, carbon and oxygen, taking up water, again, hydrogen and oxygen, and uh, they are basically stitching those three ingredients together, CH and O, um, and using the energy from the sun. And they are building their bodies. They are building their biomass and a whole range of other compounds. And thankfully for us, they also release then that oxygen in the process of growing, of photosynthesizing and, and growing their bodies. Uh, as important as this process is, and this is really the foundation of, of all life on earth, there's a, an important ingredient um, missing in this, in this nice little image. And that is the importance of nutrition, the role of the essential minerals, the macro and micro essential minerals. It's not just about the, the sun, the energy, the air, the water, the minerals uh, have to um, also be there and also be supporting plant growth because those minerals are the catalysts. And they are the catalysts that make that photosynthetic process happen. So we've got to bring in some discussions about plant nutrition in order to help drive this overall process of photosynthesis. So again, if we look at photosynthesis, just a nice little icon image here to a little bit more detail. I'm really saying the exact same thing, but just a little more detail in the picture here. Um, again, it's that carbon dioxide, it's the water in the presence of sun, and then the minerals acting as part of enzymes or catalysts which are then catalyzing the stitching together of the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen to produce that glucose, that sugar molecule, that very first product of photosynthesis. And uh, again, that oxygen. Now, the point is we need a certain minerals that are directly involved in helping and facilitating this process. And we can't do it without them. And equally, what the plant then does uh, with that building block, with the glucose molecule, is it then begins to stitch lots of those sugars together to form larger chain sugars and larger chain complex, more complex carbohydrates. It will link in some nitrogen or some sulfur into some of that carbon and build amino acids uh, and link those together and build proteins. 
and on and on, the plants will then synthesize a whole host of other plant compounds that it needs directly for its primary metabolism, for its primary growth to build its body, build its biomass, um, such as again, fats and uh, waxes, um, plant growth regulators, hormones and vitamins, uh, and onwards into some of these other more secondary metabolites. So these other biochemicals that the plants also release. So things like smells and scents, aromatic compounds, volatile organic compounds, um, other nutrients, phytonutrients, colors, flavors, which are good for taste for us, um, pigments, um, equally defense chemicals, protective compounds, um, other structural compounds and other metabolic compounds. I mean, a whole host of other uh, things. I mean, in fact, everything, I mean, everything that the plant is made up of and that it requires ultimately comes from um, that very first building block. Uh, and then also root exudates, which we're gonna talk, elaborate a little more in detail. And so again, the point is just to say that we need a supply of all of the essential macro and micro minerals in various different pathways, which all help to catalyze all of these um, kind of secondary processes to turn that simple sugar into more um, diverse and uh, more complex compounds. And right, this image, what we're seeing here, I mean, this really is the essence of production and the essence of plant health. Um, you know, your productivity and your profitability as a farmer is ultimately directly related to how well this process is being managed, how well the plants are growing. Now, of course, traditionally, we've looked at then supplying those mineral catalysts through the use of fertilizers. Uh, and that, of course, is one way uh, to do that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the session now. Um, but of course, there are other ways to use biological processes to also unlock and make available some of the nutrients from the soils as well. And that's uh, therefore an important counterbalance to this discussion. And of course, traditionally in agriculture, we've had a very soil chemistry centric view. We are now taking a step back and looking a lot more holistically, bringing some of the emerging understanding of biological processes to help supply those nutrients to be part of that story, just to rebalance that picture um, and optimize both processes. So, uh, so that's really the core of the idea. Now, from photosynthesis, we also produce, the plants produce roots and these all important roots exudates. And we're gonna move on and talk a, a little more about um, those particularly. But just a, a quick summary slide, we could, we could do a whole hour long on plant nutrition. And I, that's not the attempt for today. It's just to put a summary slide on here to highlight that all of these essential macro and micro minerals are important. And in one way or another, they are helping that photosynthetic process or the various metabolic pathways uh, that or subsequent metabolic pathways that come from that. Um, in various ways and means, all of these essential minerals are helping to drive photosynthesis, drive plant productivity, and they're all important. We can't just focus on a handful, on some of the major ones, to the neglected some of the others. They're all important, and often there's important balances that need to be um, optimized between certain minerals uh, as well. So, you know, in summary, just to highlight that, okay, nitrogen, as we know, really important for things like um, protein, um, but also part of the DNA, chlorophyll, phosphorus, really important for energy, potassium is really important for sugar movement, carbohydrate transportation into de developing fruits and grains, that kind of thing. Calcium is important for cell division, cell wall strength, magnesium really important for chlorophyll, I'm going to talk about that. Sulfur also really important for amino acids and protein synthesis. I snuck silicon here on this list. Technically, it's not essential, but it's a very beneficial nutrient. Um, can really help to optimize plant resilience to both uh, diseases, to insect pests, um, and also a whole host of other uh, environmental stresses as well. And then we move to some of the trace minerals. Boron, really important for flowering and reproduction, for example. Copper, really important for um, disease protection. It helps to synthesize things like um, more structural compounds in the plant. Uh, zinc is a really important one. It has a direct role governing leaf size. Uh, and, you know, the leaf size is, your, the leaf is your solar panel. And that's what's capturing that sunlight and that sunlight energy to help drive photosynthetic processes. So, you know, the, the size of that leaf or the solar panel is critically important. And zinc has a very a direct role in influencing that, for example. Um, manganese important for reproductive processes, seed um, viability, um, improving germination, things at the other end as well, at the restart of the next season. Iron, really important for chlorophyll. And then some other trace minerals as well, molybdenum, cobalt, and nickel, all having a very important link with nitrogen metabolism and nitrogen use. 
um, and also nitrogen fixation as well. So, um, you know, just this kind of, obviously just scooting through that list, but there's tons we could say about each of them, but really just emphasize that they are all important and, and a deficiency of any one of those can hold back that photosynthetic potential, um, which uh, is going to have direct implications on the, the soil functionality. And just to cherry pick out a few quick examples, um, if we think about then chlorophyll as the site of photosynthesis, there emerges then certain minerals that are really important in this picture. And okay, magnesium is the central element to the chlorophyll molecule. So we can't build good chlorophyll without magnesium. And then as you can see, we have four nitrogens attached onto that. So if we don't have good magnesium and good nitrogen, we can't build good chlorophyll. And we can't build good amounts of chlorophyll, well, that's our engine room. That's how we drive the photosynthetic process. That's where the magic happens. So those two nutrients are critically important um, to even get started. Now, iron, or it's not part of the chlorophyll molecule, plays a very specific and very direct role in the synthesis of the creation of that molecule, the building of that molecule. So iron is also super important uh, for photosynthesis and uh, zinc also perhaps to a slightly lesser extent, but, but also um, has a, a very important role here. So just, just some examples that if we're looking at optimizing this photosynthetic process, we've got to start at the basics and things like magnesium, and of course, nitrogen, but also iron, really important. And equally along the same lines, if we were to think about um, how do we encourage good root biomass and good rooting, because here we are talking all about the soil microbes and all of those interactions down below, you know, it's all about the roots that are feeding them. You know, it's really what's happening below ground. It's roots and root exudates, not really what's happening above ground. Now, of course, they're linked and above ground is your solar panel and that's where the action's happening, but more directly, it's roots that play a very direct role in supporting soil biology. So, you know, for example, certain nutrients are really important for good root biomass. Phosphorus is the, the well-known one, of course, um, but also sulfur is particularly important. That's especially true on legumes, has a very direct role in improving nodulation as well. Um, and also boron, especially true in brassicas. Boron is also really important for carrying sugars and carbohydrates down to the root system, trans translocating them down to the root system. So, you know, just as examples, you know, these kind of three, um, additionally, these three nutrients would be also particularly important from a below ground perspective. So nitrogen and magnesium, iron from above ground and uh, things like phos, sulfur or boron, particularly important from a, a below ground perspective. And encouraging uh, good roots is then a, a really important story as we that we'll move now to talk a little bit about building soil organic matter and, and kind of wider soil health. If we think about when we grow plants, uh, there's these three fractions of carbon that ultimately enter the system. It can either be the shoots on the surface, the roots down below, or those root exudates. These are the three carbon fractions from that come from the plant that get integrated into the soil uh, during the growth cycle of the plant or, of, of course, after the death and decay of those plant materials. And this nuance uh, and taking time to think about these three fractions is really important from a soil organic matter point of view. And the first reason um, it's really important and to factor in those three fractions from a soil organic matter point of view. And the first reason is because it is roots and not really the shoots that build soil organic matter, that make soil organic matter. And indeed, there's a really substantial body of evidence that all points in this direction just to say that roots make a much bigger contribution than shoots. Shoots, the above ground biomass makes a minor contribution to building soil organic matter. It's not to say that it has zero importance, but it's not the primary pathway. It is not the major contributor. It is all about roots. So if you want to build soil organic matter, you have to grow more root biomass. And we have a really good body of evidence to support that. And this is uh, a summary table just from one of those studies. This was a review of lots of other studies. And as you can see here, what they're looking at is uh, from a, a range of different studies, what was the percent of below ground biomass or roots that ultimately got integrated into the soil organic matter versus what percentage of the above ground uh, or the shoot material was integrated into the soil organic matter. And I won't dwell, but if you just scan your eyes down this list, to look at, okay, what percentage of roots stayed in the soil, were captured, uh, were ultimately um, sequestered into the soil organic matter pools. And you can see here's all the numbers there. 
And if we scan our eye down the list of what percentage of shoot material, you can see that the numbers across the board are uh, indeed much lower. Okay, so shoot material plays a lesser, uh, so it's more of a supporting role. The real star of the show is the roof. So I think that's a really important point um, to kind of put the context of soil health um, in, to ensure that we can build soil organic matter. Because as we all know, there's lots of benefits to soil organic matter and it's a really important metric to try and build. Now, why um, then have we seen all sorts of um, declines often with in soil organic matter, particularly with the intensification of agriculture? Um, in a lot of, lot of areas around the world, generally there's been a decline in soil organic matter. And there's kind of three kind of key reasons for this. And let's have a look at, at the first one. Here we're looking at the impact of nitrogen fertilization. And it turns out that when we use nitrogen fertilizers, that primarily encourages above ground biomass. And it does that at somewhat at the expense of the root biomass. Now, again, there's a bit of a link and a relationship between the two, of course there is, but um, across the board, as, as this graph is nicely illustrating, the percentage of carbon that plants allocate to below ground, um, you can see as we increase the nitrogen fertilization rates, the amount of below ground carbon allocation um, is declining. So what, what nitrogen is good at is driving yield. It pushes above ground biomass. Okay, and that's why nitrogen fertilizers do what they do, but that is a trade-off and comes at the expense of below ground. So over time, uh, that it means we've had less and less roots coming into the soil, and therefore one of the potential reasons that soil organic matters have been declining. So the intensity of nitrogen fertilization has been one factor. The other factor has been plant breeding. Of course, we've been breeding for yield. And when we breed for yield, we are breeding for a greater allocation of carbon above ground. And so here we're looking at just a simple pot trial, uh, but nonetheless, same um, soil type sown on the same day. We're looking at an einkorn um, heritage wheat on the left and a modern durum on the right. And you can see that the older, more traditional variety clearly allocates a lot more carbon down below ground. And you know those big roots are great for scavenging moisture, scavenging nutrients. There's a lot of resilience that comes um, from those bigger root systems and a greater exploration and, and exploitation of the resources from the soil. So breeding has definitely been a, a, another major factor that has seen us um, producing less roots over time. And then the last one would be this transition or conversion to annual based cropping systems from perennial to annuals. We know that perennial plants also allocate a, a much greater amount of carbon down to the below ground. And so here we're looking at uh, indeed this exact graph, looking at um, comparing some crops in pink versus you know, a grassland perennial system um, in green. And you can see that an annual plant, um, it will pump a lot of carbon down to the root system and out as root exudates uh, rapidly on, but then of course it's, a, it's an annual, it has a shorter plant life cycle. Um, it actually peaks around about 50 or 60 odd days and then the root exudates then begin to decline thereafter. And that differs compared to a perennial, for example, a grassland in green, you can see they also peak early on, but then they have a much more slow and sustained um, allocation of carbon to below ground over time. Okay, so this shift away from perennials uh, into annuals, which do allocate less carbon below ground has also been a, a factor. Okay, so all three of those reasons um, are really important. Now, if we can kind of zoom in a little here to look specifically at root exudates beyond the root biomass itself, the traditional view of root exudates has really focused on, um, again, that kind of soil chemistry centric view of soils that we had for a long time. Um, we kind of, of course, have known about plant root exudates for a long time, but we often looked at them in the context of, well, the plants release acids, uh, hydrogen and organic acids to solubilize minerals from the soil, to strip those minerals, make them available for uptake. Okay, and we had a, a kind of more of a heavy focus on the role of these organic acids to directly solubilize nutrients from the soil and release those for plant uptake. As we've now transitioning to a more holistic view of soils, we're bringing in the other half of the story. It's not to say that that half is wrong. Of course, it's not. It's absolutely valid. It's just that it's incomplete. So the other half of the story, well, we also know that plants release sugars, carbohydrates, all sorts of food sources 
more so to feed all of those organisms that we've been hearing about today. And the reason that the plant will invest actually quite heavily in feeding those organisms is because microorganisms are much more effective, much more efficient. They have many more tools in the toolbox. They're much better at actually scavenging minerals and solubilizing minerals from the soil and, and ultimately releasing those. So this is more of a indirect pathway and indirect access to soil nutrients by feeding the biology first and letting them do the work. And of course, so plants, they can solubilize minerals themselves directly. It's just that microbes can do it so much better. And so the plant would rather invest in them and let them use all of their genetic, genetic diversity and therefore all of the various tools that come from that, all of the various mi microbial metabolites, that their various acids and enzymes and chelators and things that can grab onto those nutrients and make them available to, to the plant. Okay, so that's now a much more um, holistic view of, of root exudates. And, and as we've talked about, I just put these images up to highlight that, okay, these are the types of organisms that ultimately that we're trying to feed through um, the growth of our roots and root exudates, the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes, the soil insects earthworms, etc. Okay, they're all really important as part of they're all really important as part of that soil food web and that, that soil ecosystem uh, at large. Now when we talk about root exudates, and you often hear that we hear this kind of use of the term sugars, oh plants release sugars as, as root exudates. Nothing wrong with that statement, but just that it is also a gross simplification of the true and intricate and dynamic nature of root exudates. Plant root exudates are much more than just organic acids and sugars and carbohydrates. Indeed, these are the, the, the main groups of root exudates, uh, as, as well as amino acids. These are the main three. Um, but indeed, the plant releases all of these kind of other different types of chemicals, biochemicals. And these are also, there's a lot of emerging um, science and studies, uh, research looking at um, these various different root exudates, categorizing them and understanding their, their function and their effects on the soil microbiome. And there's, um, you know, things like the emergence of the role of things like cover crops and using plants to force very specific functions um, has helped to, to speed along some of that kind of research. So just to say that there's a whole host of other chemicals and biochemicals, and these chemicals are ultimately communication chemicals. They're signaling molecules. This is how the plants are communicating to the microbes, sending these very specific signals through these chemicals to activate certain microbes, to recruit them, maybe to turn them off, uh, maybe to suppress them, maybe to activate them. And you've heard a lot about that this morning, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, but just to say that they're very important in this communication. And this is a nice image illustrating that. You can see this small plant here. It's releasing a very specific fingerprint, a very specific composition of exudates represented by these little colors shapes. And that is activating and recruiting certain microbes that have a feeding preference for those exudates. Okay, so you know this is a small seedling, maybe it needs some phosphorus for root development. It, it might be releasing these exudates to recruit those phosphorus solubilizing bacteria um, at that time. But as the plant moves through its development stages, um, you know, now it's uh, moving towards reproduction, for example. Well, now it's changed the composition of those exudates. It's releasing a different fingerprint, uh, some new root exudates here, the blue ones you can see. And therefore, we are now activating and recruiting a new microorganism um, to serve a particular function. Okay, so just to highlight that root exudates, they're not static. They're hugely uh, dynamic. They ebb and flow. They change. Um, it is a very intricate process in which we are only just beginning um, to understand. And on top of that, indeed, microbes themselves also induce changes in the plant. Um, and Jody touched on this also in, in her talk just, just previously. Uh, microbes also influence the root exudation process. And this was a really neat study that um, show, demonstrated this in a hydroponic, in a kind of solution culture context. They took the plant and, and used one of this kind of split root design where they could take the one plant, split the root system in half and have half of it growing in this growth chamber and the other half of the root system growing in this chamber. Then they took some soil and uh, made a little soil water dilution and added, inoculated uh, just one of the chambers with those microorganisms, but not the other side. 
And what that did is, is that when we inoculated the one side with all of those various microbes, indeed, they released all of their microbial metabolites, all of their growth promoting substances, all those things that we've heard about this morning. Um, and that induced were detected and um, that those signaling molecules were um, detected and induced uh, changes in plant growth, changes in photosynthetic activity, changes that were then reflected in the plant's root exudation. So over here on the right-hand side, then they were measuring the root exudates. And of course, you know, on the right-hand side, didn't receive the inoculant of the microbes, but they were detecting changes in the root exudate profile uh, over on the right-hand side here, which were um, coming from the plant, which were induced indirectly from the original uh, soil inoculant there. So just, just I share that to highlight, it's very much also a two-way street. It's not just that plants are, controlling or manipulating the microbes. Indeed, they're doing it a little bit in reverse. Uh, it's very much a, an interaction and a two-way uh, street between them. So how can we support uh, this process of root exudation? It is arguably the most important process, I would argue, in terms of supporting the soil microbes, um, how we feed them root exudates are their preferred food source, Microbes love to associate this process. Here are some factors that influence both the quality and quantity of root exudates. So there are some other biotic factors and so living factors and okay, different plant species would be the first one. Different plant species release a different composition, a different cocktail of exudates. So, you know, grasses are very different to legumes, uh, very different to brassicas. You know, they each have a very unique fingerprint of these exudate um, cocktails. Then the plant age is also a factor. We know that uh, plants will release the bulk of their exudates more so in the vegetative stages of growth. So it's really in that first kind, of, especially the first four to five to six weeks <clears throat> of establishment. It's that kind of window where we have the bulk of the exudation happening. As the plant then shifts into reproductive mode, where it's now going to think about reproducing, flowering, producing grain, fruit, etc. Uh, it is at that reproductive stage where the plant actually begins to turn the tap off and it slows down root exudation um, and prioritizes allocating uh, photosynthates and things uh, into its um, grain, into the seed, etc. So keeping this is part of the reason why grazing uh, is a very good and rapid way to build soil organic matter is that, of course, grazing generally is firstly perennial. So we have more root allocation down below, more root biomass, as I touched on earlier. But when we graze the plants, we keep them in that, those veg, kind of more vegetative stages and that keeps those root exudates turned on. Uh, plant nutrition, I scooted over that to, to open the lecture today, just to highlight that certain nutrients that help to catalyze photosynthesis um, and then uh, are also really important. And through driving photosynthesis, we also drive the production of root exudates through various metabolic pathways. So having a limitation of any one of those micro or macro minerals can hold back photosynthesis, therefore hold back biomass production and hold back root exudation. So plant nutrition is a really important piece of this puzzle as well. At neighboring plants, this is an interesting one. There's some really neat studies looking at intercropping systems these days and also looking at how uh, the different neighboring plant systems interact, those root systems, but also even how they release volatile organic compounds, those smells and scents, the aromatic compounds, how they actually communicate to each other through volatile uh, organic compounds that are uh, kind of triggered and received by the the foliage of the plants and that can again induce changes in root exudation down below. So neighboring plants is another one. Uh, interacting organisms, I just gave an example there of how the soil microbes themselves can also induce changes, um, but of course even other, micro other organisms, so even things like um, diseases, um, herbivores or insect pests, uh, these kinds of attacks uh, can also induce from pests, can also induce changes in the root exudation profile. When the plant is under attack from an insect or disease, it will change its root exudation profile to specifically recruit uh, beneficial microbes from the soil who will help, that, help the plant to mount its defenses, to mount its counter attack. Uh, so indeed, various pest pressures can induce changes as well. And then we have some of the abiotic factors. Here's your kind of more environmental considerations. So things like the light and temperature, of course, they directly influence photosynthesis. So that ultimately does also have a big impact. Uh, and then things like soil pH, soil moisture, and soil nutrient supply. All of those other things can induce 
changes. Um, we know plants that are drought stressed will change their root exudation pattern. Uh, for example, all sorts of other environmental stresses can induce these kinds of changes. So that's your kind of list of factors that influence both, not just the uh, quality, uh, but also the quantity um, of those root exudates. So then we're going to, let's move now to segueing on to the extending this discussion on building soil organic matter. Now, part of this new paradigm of building soil organic matter and this growing importance of, uh, that we understand of root uh, and root exudates and how important they are for nurturing and feeding soil biology, it turns out uh, it, that root exudates may also be a critically important piece of the puzzle in terms of building soil organic matter a piece of the puzzle that perhaps we've somewhat neglected, traditionally speaking, and we have this growing body of evidence that is pointing in the direction that exudates are um, very, very important um, and may even be more important than stubbles or residues, for example, um, but we, we certainly need to build on the knowledge, um, build on some of the knowledge gaps to support this, but there's a growing body of evidence that might suggest this. And, and the rationale is a really quite a simple one. You're looking at two different sources of carbon that can come into the soil and this carbon has to be processed by the microbes in order to turn and ultimately be turned into soil organic matter. Here we have of course sugars, carbohydrates, amino acids, a mixture of very labile, very small and simple carbon substrates, food sources that are highly available for the microbes, easy to assimilate, rapid and easy assimilation of these very simple uh, carbon substrates versus over here we have our crop residues, our stubbles, rich in structural compounds. These are more metabolic compounds, these are structural compounds, so things like lignin, cellulose, uh, etc. Okay, some of those more structural things. And the point is that microbes can't actually just immediately digest this li lignin and complex stuff. Uh, it, they have to excrete, they have to expend energy to excrete these enzymes uh, that will break apart uh, chemically, and it's an enzymatic digestion to break apart uh, this complex material to make it smaller so that they can then ingest it and digest it. And really the, the crux of the argument says that, well, if microbes have to expend energy synthesizing these external enzymes to break down this more complex material, well, that process is coming at an energetic cost that the microbe is, you could argue, is maybe wasting energy. It's expending a lot of unnecessary energy to produce those enzymes to break down that stubble. Now, alternatively, if they were feeding on root exudates, they don't have to produce those. They can just feed. And therefore they're saving all of that energy on producing those external enzymes so they can just feed and grow. And that means that ultimately that root exudates have a greater carbon use efficiency. They more efficiently feed microbes. We can grow more microbial biomass per unit of root exudate than we can uh, per unit of complex litters, complex substrates for that energy wasted um, kind of expended reason that I mentioned. So this is how easily or how efficiently we feed soil microbes uh, is really important um, because uh, they play such an important role in building soil organic matter. So here's an interesting study that then was comparing these, these two and said, okay, let's compare how efficient are exudates versus um, crop, uh, plant stubbles, crop residues in building soil organic matter. And so here's the study saying the evidence for the primacy or the importance of those living root inputs, not root or shoot litter in forming soil organic carbon. So recent theory suggests that living root uh, inputs uh, like root exudates, etc., um, exert a disproportionate influence on soil organic matter formation, but few studies have explicitly tested this by separately tracking the living root inputs versus those litter inputs as they move through the soil food web and into the various soil carbon pools. We show that those living root inputs are 2 to 13 times uh, more efficient than litter inputs in forming both slow cycling mineral associated organic matter so that's more of the stable fractions of the soil carbon um, as well as the fast cycling or particulate organic matter um, that both of those pools are, um, uh, are formed much more efficiently from root exudates two to 13 times more efficiently um, versus stubbles okay and that's for that explanation i was just talking about with the um, 
the plant having to synthesize those external enzymes, which costs them energy, and therefore they've got less energy to simply reproduce and grow more biomass. Now, why it's so important to grow microbial biomass and grow more of it rather than have them producing those enzymes, but save more energy and grow more biomass, that's really important because part of the growing um, paradigm of soil organic matter formation highlights that that microbial biomass is a critical contrib um, contributor to soil organic matter. But particularly, it's not the microbial biomass itself, it's the dead microbial biomass. This is called microbial necromass. And it is once microbes die, in which they then have the potential to form very stable uh, soil organic matter. And this image is kind of depicting this here. We can feed the, the soil with plant materials. And again, that could be exudates, that could be roots, or that could be shoots, any one of them. Uh, then the microbes grow, they feed, but then they, when they run out of food, they begin to starve, they begin to die off, and then they begin to decay. And this decay process uh, is where their various cell walls, their bodies, their uh, particularly the cell wall structures, their decaying plant bodies, when these decaying, uh, sorry, microbial bodies interact with soil surfaces, they can be stabilized uh, into very um, stable forms of uh, soil organic matter. And this is part of the growing paradigm that highlights that this uh, critical step here of this decaying and dying microbes and how they interact with soil surfaces is a key leverage point for um, sequestering soil organic matter. And so here's a study then that was building on that last one to say, okay, well, how big of a contribution this microbial necromass makes? So they were quantifying how much of soil organic carbon is made of this microbial necromass. And we show, as it highlights here, that that microbial necromass can make up of more than half of the soil organic carbon. Hence, we suggest that next generation field management requires promoting microbial biomass formation and necromass preservation to maintain healthy soils, ecosystems, and climates. Okay, so the, the key difference here is just to say that we traditionally focused on plants and the decay of plant material, that that was the major contributor to soil organic matter. Now we see that it is both plants and microbes, and particularly those dead microbes. It is the two that play a role and they both need equal importance. And we've traditionally been focusing on one half, much to the neglect of uh, of the other half. And so here's a, 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 an image just kind of summarizing this now. It's just to say that as plant materials come into the soil, if they're very complex, like the lignin, the cellulose, if they're very complex, they go, they're much more difficult for the microbes to ingest. So they go through that enzymatic attack. They don't, these complex materials, if they're too large and complex, they don't enter a microbial body. They just get attacked by those enzymes. And that means as they get attacked by those enzymes, the, the, the plant material is a continuum of decay. It's kind of complex things progressively getting broken down into smaller parts. It's a continuum there. And only when the parts get small enough can they be assimilated by an organism. And this is a critical point, whether or not the plant materials ever enter a microbial body or not. Do they stay outside of a microbial body and just get attacked by the enzymes? Or do they enter, be consumed and, be, and enter a living organism? And so here we're looking at then the in vivo versus ex vivo or through a microbe or not through a microbe pathways. And as we're pointing out is that the more available fractions like those root exudates, uh, they more easily enter the microbial body. Um, and this paper here is talking about this as a microbial carbon pump. And when those carbon sources enter the microbial body, they form that microbial necromass. And that is the key builder of the soil organic matter. So, so this is the contrast of the two kind of paradigms, I guess you would say. Uh, on the left-hand side is the old view. We had this over-focus on catabolism or breakdown or decomposition of plant materials, taking that lignin complex stuff and you know, progressively breaking it down. And the, the paradigm said, we want to kind of slow this process. We want to keep more complex things in the soil. That way they will live in the soil for longer, therefore bring more functional benefit. But the new paradigm says, well, actually, no, what we want is to get all of these materials into a microbe, into a body, and then we want these anabolic processes or the rebuilding or the resynthesis, not breakdown, but the resynthesis of taking those constituent parts and rebuilding microbial bodies. 
rebuilding those cell walls. And it is through microbial biomass and microbial necromass in which we will then um, build the more stable fractions of soil organic matter. Okay, so this was just um, a summary to close on this point. Uh, a, just a few quotes from a recent study. Uh, this particular journal put out, put out an issue all about microbial necromass. And this was just the opening um, editorial for that, for that issue. So microbial necromass on the rise, the growing focus of its role in soil organic matter development. It had long been believed that remnants of decayed plant matter were the main components of the persistent carbon in soil. Increasing evidence has led to the paradigm shift that dead microbial mass is the dominant component of particularly of the longer lasting or the more stable fractions rather than decaying plant matter. Accordingly, this evidence is shifting the research focus from humic matter to the microbial contributions. However, the microbial controls of that biomass formation and necromass stabilization, um, indeed, we have some knowledge gaps there. We, there's definitely some evidence there we need to plug uh, to then really support and enhance this process to its, to its full potential. Okay, so this is a, then a nice, really nice summary slide that wraps this up just to say that plants are photosynthesizing, as I touched on this morning, they're growing, photosynthesizing, then they re release those rutex roots and rutexidates, feed those microbes, they grow, they die, when they die, that necromass this is a really important point that I, we could talk about so much more, but I obviously have to move on. But just to say that it is also that necromass, that dead microbial bodies that um, must be stabilized in the soil. So the dead microbial bodies have to then be adhered to the soil mineral surfaces or wrapped up within soil aggregates. This stabilization process is key. It's not just about producing microbial necromass, it's about chemically and physically stabilizing it, be that attaching it to the mineral surfaces or to the uh, soil aggregates. Okay, um, I can see I'm a little over time, so I'm gonna have to go through this last bit really, really quickly. Uh, and then hopefully so we can leave some time for some questions as well at the end. Here, I just wanna then sit this discussion in a wider integrated nutrient management or systems approach. And here, I just wanna emphasize that our traditional use of um, fertilizers uh, is not overly efficient. There's a lot of efficiency gains to be had. If we look at how much of our fertilizers actually enter the plant, uh, for nitrogen, it's 40, 50, 60 odd percent in this ballpark, 10 to 20 percent of phosphorus supplied inputs um, enter the plant, potassium 40 odd percent. Now these numbers are guidelines, okay, they're going to be variable for different soil types and, and that kind of thing uh, in different contexts, but they Ill illustrate a point which is there's a lot of room for improvement. Okay, there's a lot of opportunities to improve our nutrient use efficiencies. And part of that discussion is just to acknowledge that in soils, uh, nutrients exist in three different pools. It's not just what's in the soluble and the soil water pool um, or the medium term supply, the exchangeable pool, that soils also have a much larger total pool. And this is the pool of nutrients that are present, but not necessarily plant available. They're there, but they're locked up. Uh, maybe still part of the, the mineral surfaces, mineral matrix of the soil or locked up with other minerals. But nonetheless, they're there. They're waiting to be unlocked. Um, and indeed, some of the biological processes that we've heard about earlier this morning can help to unlock those. So, and the, the point is just to say that there is a significant amount of these total pool of nutrients in soils. It's by far the biggest fraction, um, the biggest pool. Uh, you do have, most soils uh, have a good nutrient reserve in them, um, which we can then obviously try to utilize, access and unlock um, through better biological cycling. So how can we improve nutrient use efficiencies? I'm gonna scoot through each of these really quickly and just give a quick example. Um, let's take a systems approach. Let's overall look at the soil health principles and try to improve soil health, however we define that. Um, you know, using things like four Rs, uh, of course, is important. Integrating our nutrient management, using things like carbon-based inputs, being very efficient with things like seed treatments or foliar sprays, and maybe using plants through cover crops or maybe a little bit of plant diversity through, through intercropping, for example. Okay, so you've all heard of the soil health principles. I won't dwell. It's just to say that they make sense. Uh, and of course, using biological products um, within soils means that we need to make the soil as a um, hospitable environment as we can. We don't want it to be too hostile. We want the soils to be a, an ecosystem in which those microbials will then thrive. So, you know, embracing soil focused related principles like this, I think is, a, is makes a good sense. 
we're going to increase the likelihood that our microbial products and inoculants may be using will thrive in that soil ecosystem if we are minimizing soil disturbance, uh, maximizing diversity, keeping the soil covered with litters or living plants, those are living roots, and potentially integrating livestock where possible. So, you know, take that systems approach and, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Integrated nutrient management, this really just refers to integrating as many different tools as possible into the toolbox to manage fertility. So, um, you know, yes, one of the classic ways it's often talked about is combining organics with inorganics, so organic fertilizers with inorganic fertilizers, carbon-based inputs with our nutrients. Um, but it could be other crop residues, composts, manures, using microbials for end fixation, for example, um, or phosphorus liberation, all the things that we've also heard about this morning, um, or the, uh, maybe the use of livestock and manure. The point is to say, if we integrate all of these strategies, uh, we can then minimize our dependency on those synthetic fertilizer inputs. And uh, that's just a, an illustration of why we want to then use a combination of organic and inorganic nutrients, carbon-based inputs, rather than apply nutrients on their own in an ionic form, which makes them much more vulnerable, much more reactive. They could be leached, they can lock up, they can volatilize. If we combine them with a carbon source, we wrap that up and we stabilize, stabilize the nutrient, we change that behavior. And we also buffer that nutrient um, uh, for, for some of its saltiness or the acidicness of it, um, help to buffer some of those negatives to support and protect uh, soil biology as well. So carbon-based inputs is a, a really good strategy rather than applying fertility on its own. And, and then we can be very efficient with how we use nutrients um, or microbials, either one. This is relevant for both where, you know, with a seed treatment, we're talking about very, very small amounts of materials that are going onto that seed. It might only be five to 10 liters of input of material per ton of seed, but we're targeting the application of it right around that seed. Okay, so a very efficient way. And similarly with things like liquid inject, injecting those materials right directly into the furrow, uh, coating that seed equally or directing it at the bottom of that furrow. However, we might do that, um, getting a very targeted and precise application of these materials, be that nutrition, be that microbials, um, right there where they're critically required. Uh, we could do a whole session on this, but I'll just um, acknowledge that I also think that foliar applied nutrients have a lot of potential. And for the, the key point that I opened the lecture with is just to say that photosynthesis is the pump that primes sugar and carbohydrate, et cetera, production. And that's what ultimately primes root exudates. And root exudates are the preferred food source of our soil microbiota, okay? So they love to associate with roots and feed on those exudates. So however, we can encourage good root exudation. And I went through that list of strategies earlier. And, and I believe that really foliars present a really nice opportunity to address mineral limitations, you know, do a tissue test or a sap test, um, identify what your limitations are, apply those essential minerals through foliage. We don't want to put too much into the soil. And again, this can have negative consequences. Like a lot of these nutrients can lock up or negatively influence the soil biota. So we can target it through the foliage instead, deliver the minerals, prime the photosynthetic pump, prime the root exudation process and feed the soil biology and let them do the unlocking. Let them do the nutrient cycling down in the soil. But we're just using very small amounts and targeted amounts of nutrition and nutrients to um, prime that, uh, that system. Okay, so foliars, I think, are a, a useful piece of the puzzle. And okay, that's what I was really saying there just then. Um, foliars is really, foliar applied nutrients is really all about indirect stimulation of microbes because of the way that those foliars prime photosynthesis, prime root exudates. And really that's what foliar nutrition is all about to me. It's about optimizing this process here in order to feed those uh, soil microbes. And lastly, um, and I'll wrap up here, just to say that um, diversity and a little bit of plant species diversity is an interesting topic as well. Uh, I touched on how different plant species also release um, different root exudates. So, you know, here we have a cereal. A cereal, based on its genetics, has a very specific fingerprint of root exudates, a very specific composition of these exudates. Now, if we took that cereal from a monoculture and combine it with, for example, even an intercrop, in introducing one other companion, um, what looks like a legume here in this example, well, now that different plant species 
has a different root system and a different composition of root exudates. And when those two grow together and those root systems begin to interact and intermingle, we see a synergy where that one plus one is equaling three. There's a, a synergy between the two because when the roots are intermingling, it means that, for example, the cereal, as its roots grow into the rhizosphere of the legume and the legume is releasing its very unique fingerprint of its exudates, activating certain microbes that it requires, well, the cereal can benefit from that activation from the other partner and, and vice versa. The legume can benefit from its roots growing into the rhizosphere of the cereal um, because the cereal can uniquely um, activate certain microbes that the legume can't. So there's a synergy that involves there um, whereby the, the whole is, is greater than the sum of the parts. So I think this little discussion around diversity is an interesting one and intercrops particularly have a, a really big opportunity. And, and, you know, as I touched on before, it's not just the below ground, it's also these volatile organic compounds. And there's some really interesting work looking at how these plants also communicate between these, these volatile compounds. And they can either be suppressive and antagonistic towards each other, or they can be supportive. And there's some studies that have shown that certain volatiles released off the plant, one plant partner can induce immune responses, activate the immune system um, of the other one in, in very beneficial ways, for example. Uh, and again, even induce changes of root exudation down below um, as well as that would not be induced otherwise if that uh, other plant partner wasn't there. And so here's then a practical example of this. Here we're looking at a intercropper of wheat and soybean growing under P limiting conditions. So this was a really interesting one where they compared a monoculture soybean, a monoculture wheat, and then an intercrop of the two. And they compared all of those treatments in a uh, P limiting conditions and P sufficient conditions. Um, so with adequate P and not enough P. And interesting what they found here was that the total dry root weight the root length and the root surface area all significantly increased in the pea deficient system when the plants were intercropped. Now let's have a look at those traits again, root weight, root length and root surface area. All three of those root, those root traits, as I touched on at the beginning of the lecture, are their rooting factors. They are all driven by Phosphorus. Phosphorus is the number one mineral that drives root biomass and, and rooting, okay, along with sulfur and boron, as I touched on, but phosphorus is the big one. So here, this is interesting, even under phosphorus limiting conditions, with a little bit of plant diversity, one extra plant, and that synergy between those root exudates can actually induce increases in the rooting traits, increases in the rooting biomass, even under phosphorus limiting conditions. So it just highlights this opportunity, I think, to then bring in a little bit of plant diversity in the discussions about soil health and roots and root exudates and microbials and biologicals and things. Um, the tool of plant diversity is uh, another piece of that puzzle. Okay, so in summary, we want to optimize plant nutrition to drive that photosynthetic engine of the plant. You can choose plant species for that. We could choose different varieties for that and, and all of those which um, specifically choosing those for their rooting characteristics. You know, some varieties have bigger root systems than others. Some plant species have bigger root systems than others. And then those different plant species have the different root exudates as we were just discussing. So yeah, again, you know, keep the soil covered with living roots. That's soil health principle. If you want to keep soil biology functional, um, you've got to be feeding them and roots and root exudates are the key. So, you know, embracing that living roots soil health principle is a really, really uh, arguably maybe the most important one, critically important. Uh, as I touched on, we have the emerging paradigm that also those exudates may be um, even more important, but certainly a very important piece of the puzzle for soil organic matter formation. So consequently, take a systems approach and integrate your management strategies. Yes, use the soil health principles. Yes, be efficient with your nutrient and fertilizers, UC treatments, foliar, use carbon-based inputs, stabilize and carbon, um, stabilize your fertility with carbon, um, integrate as many different tools as possible, like manures, like biofertilizers, integrate them all as part of that integrated nutrient management strategy. And then lastly, if we can use plants, plant cover is the most important thing, definitely. And if we can, maybe a little bit of plant diversity can also be beneficial. Okay, happy to take some questions.